Hi, and welcome to the Church Unlimited podcast. Church Unlimited is a vibrant, Bible-based church in North Lakes, Queensland that is passionate about helping people discover the genuine love of Jesus. If you're currently looking for a home church, we would love for you to join us for Sunday worship. For more information about our Sunday service or to find out how we can best help you, head to our website at churchunlimited.com.au. We hope you enjoy this message from Sunday service. Welcome to church. Um, as James said, my name is Joe. I'm on the team here um, at Church Unlimited. If I haven't met you before, I'd love to meet you afterwards. I love people. Um, and so come say hi after. Um, but yeah, it's a real privilege for me um, to be on the team. And it's always a privilege to bring the Word of God. I, I consider it a real honor and a real privilege. And I have a word on my heart that I just know God's going to encourage you with um, tonight. So if you were here last Sunday, um, you might have heard Pastor Cindy. Pastor Cindy Bosky preaching. It was excellent. Now, I wasn't here, but I did watch it on YouTube this week, um, along with thousands of people. She's very popular. Um, and it was a great word. She spoke about zeal. And what I loved about the word was that she started off by talking about how sometimes we can have a short-term zeal. We can have a zeal that is like fireworks and excitement and a passion, but just like fireworks, it's a spark that might go out. But that God wants us to develop a long-term zeal, a lasting zeal. He wants us to have a slow burn, something, a passion for him, a passion for Jesus that we continually fan into flame. It was a great word. So I do encourage you um, to go and check it out on YouTube um, when you get a chance. But further to that word, I really felt on my heart to just stick with that theme of endurance, that theme of having a faith that will last the distance. You know, we are people who have faith that is not just a flash in the pan. It's not just a phase. If you're a young person here, you might have people in your world who look at you and look at your passion for Jesus and say, it's just a phase. They're going to grow up one day. They're going to see the real world. They're going to, you know, get educated. They're going to get enlightened. And then they're going to realize, you know, the truth. And they're going it's, to, it's just a phase. It's just a phase. But we are people of faith that lasts. We are people of a faith that continues, that endures, that perseveres. We have faith that is strong and unwavering in the face of whatever circumstances come our way. And so if you're taking notes tonight, my message tonight is called From Setbacks to Comebacks. And we are going to be um, speaking from Acts 14. If you have your Bibles, open them up. If you've got your version um, Bible app on your phone, open it up. We're in Acts 14. And what I just want to start, I just want to pray and ask the Spirit of God to come and speak to our hearts tonight. God, we thank you that you're here. We thank you that your presence is here. We thank you, God, that you are faithful to show up. Whenever we look to you, you come and you meet us. When we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And so tonight, we invite you, Holy Spirit, come and speak to our hearts. Come and shake us to our core so that all we can do is to depend on you, rely on you. Come and speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Well, my anchor verse, my my core verse for you tonight comes from Acts 14. And we find Acts 14, chapter uh, verse 22. It's talking about Paul visiting communities of believers, of people who are Christians, who, who, know, um, who know Jesus, and he's going and he's preaching and discipling people in different cities. And it says he goes to that city, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Continue in the faith. If you just read that verse quickly, you might read those four words and think, cool. Continue in the faith. It's kind of like Paul is the cheer squad of the church. You know, he's like, come on, guys, you can do it. You know, it's like me when I go and see my kids' sports days and I'm there on the sidelines going, woo, you can do it. Like just just this little voice from the sideline cheering them on. You can read that verse and you think, okay, that's what Paul's doing there. He's just cheering them on. He's, you know, pepping them up, saying, you can do it, guys. But you know what? These words hit different when you understand the context, the backstory of what has happened to Paul up to this point. 
And you know, I'm a big believer that God can use an individual verse to speak to us. His Word is alive and active, isn't it? It is sharper than any two-edged sword. His Word is alive and a single verse on its own can encourage you and can speak to you. But do you know what brings more weight and meaning every time to the Scriptures? It's when you know the full story. And it is incredible in this instance to realise that Paul was cheering those disciples on to continue in the faith when you read what has just happened to him. And so we're going to skip back now to Acts chapter 14, verse 8, and read from there. And just to to set the scene, Paul, if you're not familiar with him, if you don't know the Bible too well, he's a pretty important character in the Bible, in the New Testament. He has a wild story. He has a crazy testimony. Paul was originally called Saul, and he was a Pharisee. So he was a religious, a Jewish religious leader, uh, and um, he hated Christians, hated them. He spent his life persecuting them, killing them, making sure that they would die, and then he has a face-to-face encounter with Jesus and it radically changes him forever. It is wild. You know, he goes blind for a few days. I'm an optometrist and like, I, let me tell you, that doesn't happen. You don't go blind for three days and then get prayed for and start seeing. Well, not in the natural anyway, but in the supernatural, God can do these things. He can do the impossible. And so Saul becomes Paul and he goes from killing Christians to preaching the gospel, seeing people saved and healed and planting churches wherever he goes. So that's him. That's Paul. And he has quite a colorful story. And this story that we read about is no less hectic. So let's read it together, starting at verse 8. It says, now at Lystra, so that's a city, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. And I just want to pause it there for a moment because as I was preparing for this message, I read that first verse and I thought, you can just tell that something's going to happen, can't you? When you read in the Bible something he has never walked, you just know that this is just like... This is setting the scene for God to show up. And I just wanted to make a point tonight that maybe there is a never in your life, that there is something that has been said is never going to happen for you. Maybe you've been told you're never going to have a baby. Oh, I'm emotional about that. Maybe you think you're never going to get free of that mental health thing you're you're battling. Maybe there is a never in your life. And I just want to remind you to never say never with God. That is the perfect starting point for him to show up. That is exactly when he wants to move. When there is a never, that is when God shows up and does a miracle. So I just want to, that's an aside. It doesn't have anything to do with my message tonight, but I just want you to know, never say never with God. It is the start of the story. And so we, go, we continue on. And this man, he listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out to the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also a men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven heaven and fruitful season, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Talk about a setback, hey? Talk about a change. They were at like the highest of highs and then this happens. 
And let's be real, I have had days that have held their fair share of heartbreaks or disappointments or setback. You know, there's seasons in your life where you feel like you're taking two steps forward, one step back. You're having setbacks. But for Paul, this was like two steps forward, then get beaten to within an inch of your life. All right, this was a major setback because not only was he stoned to death or near death, they thought he was dead, but it would have been particularly gut-wrenching and, and particularly difficult to handle because it had started off so well. Hey, it started off great. Let's recap. Paul, filled with the Spirit, is doing the work of God. He's sensitive to the Spirit. He sees a man who's lame. He makes him walk. A miracle happens and the people respond so well. The thing is, they're speaking in Lyconian, so we might not really understand what they're saying, but they're like worshipping him. They're giving him food. They're sacrificing to him. And, you know, they thought they were gods, Hermes and Zeus. And, you know, they're actually in Lystra, the, the city that they were in at that time, they largely believed in the Greek gods. That's the, that was the religion there. They believed in Zeus and Hermes and all the other ones. I don't know them. Um, I don't know. I was trying to give you another one, but I don't know. I don't know another Greek god off the top of my head, but, you know, all of the Greek gods. And there actually was a story, like a um, myth or a tale that they believed in Lystra at the time. And that was that hundreds of years earlier, Zeus and Hermes had visited had come to Lystra and only one lady had fed them. And so what did Zeus and Hermes do? Wiped them out, killed them all. And so when these people thought that Zeus and Hermes were vis had visited again, they were like, oh, we are not messing up this time. <laughs> all right, we do not want to get wiped out. Like not only was that miracle amazing, like that was great, but also um, let's not be smited or wiped out again. All right, so let's go over and above. Let's worship these guys, these gods. Let's give them everything. And so they would have just been lavishing their worship and their adoration on Paul and Barn Barnabas. And initially, Paul and Barnabas would have been like, this is great. You know, we face so much opposition when we go and preach with these people. They love us. They think we are awesome. But then the tide turns, doesn't it? And in a moment, the gods that they are worshipping become people that they want to kill. And it's just a terrifying flip of the masses. And I can just imagine Paul laying there wondering how the day was ending like that when it started off so good. How did he get that way? And like I said, I've suffered some disappointments. We all have. You know, praise God, he's, he's really blessed me in my life. But there's been times where I've felt disappointed or when things have started off well and then taken a turn. But I've never experienced a setback quite like this. But maybe you have. Maybe you have had a day that has flipped like that. You've gone from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows in an instant. You know, maybe your family's been touched by tragedy. You've gotten the phone call and your life has just changed. Or maybe your setback looks more like a calling that you felt certain God was calling you to and then the door slammed close. And you're like, what now? What now, God? How did we end up here? Maybe you feel like the promises of God are delayed. You're believing, you're believing, you're believing, and you're not seeing the, the answers to the prayer yet. Maybe like Cindy spoke about last week, maybe it's more, the setback is more a season of dryness where you're like, oh, I had that passion, I had that zeal, I had that excitement for Jesus, and, and right now I'm just I'm not feeling it. It's, it's wilderness, it's, it's dryness in my heart right now. Your setback could be the opposite. I, uh, I love talking to, there's a lady in my grow group. If you don't know what grow groups are, they're just our, our small groups, our discipleship groups at church. I love them, get in one. And um, a lady in my grow group was telling me about how she's so on fire for God. She's been a believer for a while, but she's just, just something's changed in her in this last 12 months. And she's so on fire for God. She can't get enough of the word, you know, that God speaks to her. And yet, They've had more spiritual attack these last few months on their family and relationships than ever before. You know, your setback can look different for each of us, but I know that you've, you've had a setback in your faith. Nod, nod, yeah? 
Yeah, good. Awesome. We've had setbacks in our faith. But what's important is, is it's the, not the end of this story. And it's not the end of your story either. Because this is what happens next. This is the cool bit. Starting from verse 20, it says, But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had heard... Uh, When they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. You know, this is why Paul is profoundly qualified to encourage the believers to continue in the faith. He got back up. He stands up and the very next day continues on to the next city to preach the gospel and disciple the believers. Paul shows us what it looks like to have unwavering, unshakable faith, faith that lasts, faith that is steadfast through the storm, faith that turns a setback to a comeback. And so tonight, I just want to share with you four things that I can see in this story, four things that will help you to move from setbacks to comebacks. Are you ready for them? The the first thing is this, don't be shocked when the setback happens. You know, this experience in Lystra was not Paul's first rodeo. Oh no, this had happened before. If we go to the start of Acts 14, so uh, verse 1, it tells the story of Paul, guess what? Preaching in another city, sharing the gospel. He's boldly declaring the truth of Jesus and he's healing people. He's performing miracles and the city's divided and some people love him and some people hate him. And in verse 5, it says this, an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them. Sound familiar? What's the definition of insanity? Insanity. Doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome, right? Have you heard that definition? You're like, definition of insanity, doing the same thing, expecting a different outcome. And it kind of leads you to question, was Paul insane? Like, honestly, you're like, Paul, are you insane? Because this has happened before. Like, why are you doing the same thing? Like, why would you go to another city, preach, and expect not to get killed? Why would you do that, Paul? Are you insane? But the thing is, we know he wasn't insane, was he? He was a very smart man. He was a very godly man. He was a Holy Spirit-filled man. He was not insane. And so what if he didn't expect a different outcome? He wasn't doing this because he expected it to be easy. He wasn't doing it because he expected it to always be successful. He wasn't doing it because he thought, oh, if I just keep going, maybe life will be easy and comfortable. No. What if he expected the risk? What if he expected the opposition? And what if he knew that there would be setbacks and storms and yet he continued in the faith anyway? You know, I'm sure he knew the words of Jesus. John uh, 16, verse 33, it says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation or troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, Jesus promises that there will be setbacks. There will be trials. It's not a possibility, it's a guarantee. That is a promise of Scripture. You're welcome. That's what you came here to hear tonight, that there will be troubles. Why? Why would Jesus tell us this? Why would he warn us? And we find the answer it just in the start of that verse. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. You know, in his love and goodness, he doesn't want us to be shocked. He wants our hearts to be resilient to be prepared for storms that may come so our faith is not destroyed. And if I can be honest with you tonight, I don't like that. I really don't like that. I struggle with that. My personality really does value safety and comfort, okay? I don't like um, heights. No, thank you. I don't like dangerous things. No, I don't like risks. No, I, I don't like being too hot. 
I also don't like being too cold, okay? I just like being comfortable. That is, is that too much to ask? Just complete safety and comfort at all times. I would like that. Would you, would you agree? That would be nice. Um, and, you know, maybe that's just me, but I also think I'm probably just a product of our society, that we live a comfortable existent, existence and our culture really values that, really likes to do things that guarantee our personal comfort and safety. Ironically, as I was preparing this message and typing away on my computer, um, an ad popped up for a product and it offered peak comfort. And I thought, I will take that. Thank you very much. I would like peak comfort. Um, uh, that can just be my, you know, slogan for myself, Joe. Peak comfort. Like, that is the life that I would personally choose if I could. But the reality is that Jesus said many times and many ways, and we see it through every story in Scripture, and we see it in the lives of everyone who's ever pursued Jesus with their whole heart, anyone who's ever done something that has made an impact in the kingdom. We see that their life is not comfortable. Christianity is not the key to a comfortable life. It is a meaningful life. It is a fruitful life. It is a healed life. It is a, what else did I write? Beautiful life. But it's not a comfortable life. A few times I got to visit a, um, a missionary who had started a, a whole town over in Borneo. Um, I went on this trip a couple of times and, and visited Living Waters Village there. And the meaning that Ronnie Habor has found in his life that's his name. He started this, this village and he has changed an entire region. He has given hope to so many children that have no homes and no future. He is sending out people to preach the gospel in tribes that don't have the written word of God yet. Like he is making such an impact. And yet you visit and you go, this is not comfortable. He could have stayed in Australia. He could have had a life that was comfortable. He could have uh, earned a really decent income. He could have done all of these things. And yet he chose to pursue the things of God. Christianity is not comfortable. And so we shouldn't be shocked when it's not. When the enemy comes to try and rob and kill and destroy, like the Bible tells us is, in, is his intention, we shouldn't be shocked when our beliefs become less appealing to the secular world in which we live. You know, I think that there's going to be this increasing pushback against believers for believing what we do. And, you know... I think there's a difference between surprise and shock, right? We're not always going to know what's going to happen to us. We're not always going to know what the future holds. There are things that are going to happen in your life that you'll be surprised by, good and bad. You know, you'll be surprised, but there's a difference between being surprised and being shocked. What does Hebrews say? Hebrews say in Hebrews 12, I think it is, it says we run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. And... Um, in case you don't realize, running is also not comfortable, okay? I have started trying to run again this year, and I say trying because it has not been very successful thus far. I'm doing one of those apps where you walk for a bit and then it tells you to run, and every time uh, it says run, I'm like, hmm. No, <laughs> I just, I, it's, I, I don't think you realize it's just not comfortable. Running is not comfortable and faith is not comfortable, but it's in the discomfort of actually doing it that you be, get better at it, right? It's in the discomfort of running that you are strengthened for the journey. And, you know, just last night, actually, I was talking to a friend of mine who was just sharing some of the setbacks that she and her family have gone through in the last few years. And... I was so encouraged by the fact that, you know, you can look at these trials and these setbacks and think, I would rather, like for my comfort, of course I would, I'd rather not have to, have to go through that. But yet, I've never encountered the love of God the way that I have through that trial. I've never, I haven't, I've grown so much more through that. I, I know Jesus in deeper and more profound ways than ever before. And so, that's the first thing. That's the first thing. We need to move on. But that's, that's the first thing that we can see from this story that will take you from a setback to a comeback is just don't be shocked 
Don't be shocked when it, ha- when it happens. Don't let it paralyze you. But let's just keep going. The second thing is don't be alone when you need to stand up. You know, stoning was a pretty um, common way to kill people in the first century. Um, grateful that that is no longer a, um, a practice in our society. Um, we have definitely seen some progress on that front. Um, but they did it pretty regularly. So I don't think it was something that they would stuff up. You know, like most of the time, if people wanted to stone someone, they would kill them. They would be dead. All right. So I don't think they, I don't think Paul was just like accidentally protected from being hurt in this situation. I think he was definitely meant to die. He was definitely close to death. And what does it tell us? So it's, an, it's no small deal. It's no small detail that it tells us in the story in verse 20. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up. Don't you think the disciples were probably praying in that moment? I mean, unless they were really bad friends and just like, come and fall, get up. Yeah, I don't think they were like that. These were believers. They would have been praying over him. They would have been asking God to heal him. They would have been strengthening him. They would have been reaching down and lifting him up and saying, we're we're with you. We're here to help you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to love you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to put your your arms over our shoulders and help you walk. That's what would have happened in this story. Paul was not alone. Just because he was the one preaching the gospel and performing these miracles didn't mean that he was alone in this, alone in his faith. And so if Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, probably your favourite Bible verse was penned by him, if he needed people, don't you think that maybe you do too? Sometimes I think we just think that we're meant to be able to do it by ourselves. We just think that we're meant to just be able to muster all our faith by ourselves and know how to pray by ourselves and not be discouraged and not get into this mental spiral by ourselves. And we've got to do it all right. And I've just got to take my thoughts captive. And I've just got to have more faith. And I've just got to have the wisdom to know what decision I should do next, even though the door closed on me and I'm not sure what I should do anymore. I've just got to figure it out on my own. And we live in this world that's so isolated. You just think, I'll just I'll just look online for some answers because I don't really have anyone that I can ask. Like, sometimes we think we've got to do it on our own. But Paul didn't. So why do we think we need to? We need to be part of the body. You know, James spoke this morning about we are the church. And he said, you know, if you just cut your hand off and had it lying on the ground, it's, it'll be dying on its own. It's not, it's not like that Wednesday Adams, you know, like it's not like that. Is that, is that the show? Is that the right reference? Okay, right. Haven't watched any Adam's Family. But, um, you know, it, it is not able, it's not able to live on its own. It needs to be connected to the body. And so we need to have friends who will check in on us and see how we're going. When they know we've experienced a disappointment, we need a friend that will check in. And you know what? You need to be that friend to someone else too. And we need to have believers that will pray with us. That's why we open up the altar. We say, look, you don't need to carry, you don't need to believe for that by yourself. We'll believe with you. I'll join my faith to yours. And we together, where two or more are gathered, there Jesus is. So we're going to believe together. Let's not give up meeting together because we need each other. That if you want to come from a setback to a comeback, you're not going to be able to do it in isolation. I don't care how much grit and determination you have. You might be like my husband who can just like decide to run. He's like, well, I haven't run for two years, but well, I'll just run a half marathon. I'm sure. It makes me really angry because I'm like, how do you decide to run? It's so hard, right? And some people think, oh, I'll just decide to have faith and I'll just decide that I, I can do this. I can believe for that. I can pull myself up out of disappointment. No, that's not how we are wired. That's not how we're meant to be. We need people to join with us in faith. And we need leaders to encourage us and champion us in our calling. And we need to lead and encourage other people in our worlds too. Don't try and make a comeback on your own. It was because of the people around Paul that he was able to get up and keep going. And the very next day goes on to the next city to continue on in his purpose And so that just brings me to my next point. 
And that is don't let go of your purpose. That's right. You know, a setback can definitely make us reconsider whether we want to keep going. I think it would have been pretty understandable if Paul, lying there on the ground, absolutely, you know, in a world of pain, close to death, just decided I'm going to hang up my preaching sandals. Um, Yeah, I've got preaching sandals tonight too. Um, I'm going to hang up my preaching sandals for now because um, I gave it my best best shot and um, it didn't turn out too well. So it mustn't be for me, um, this gospel spreading, church planting, miracle working business. Um, I'm just going to lay here until God either takes me back to heaven or maybe I will go and make tents again, okay, because that, that's what he used to do. You know, maybe, maybe that's just what I'll do. But that's not what he did. He stood up. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, um, this is the message translation, which I don't normally read, but I read it in this translation and um, I just really love the wording. And it says, with all this going for us, my dear friends, stand your ground and don't hold back. Throw yourselves into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. And you know, those verses, they just give us an insight into why he would stand up and continue on. It's because of purpose. Paul says you can stand up and carry on when you throw yourself into the work of the master. And, you know, sometimes we can feel like a setback completely derails our purpose. You know, things look different. If you lose your job, things look different. And you're like, what am am I meant to do now? You know, if you have to relocate to a new city, you think, oh, it looks different. I'm not sure how how I should carry on. You know, maybe a sudden diagnosis changes your plans. Or maybe a step of faith that you took didn't turn out the way you did. They feel like setbacks and things look different. I know for our family, there was a time where we, we were like, ministry might not have, it might not be for us. Because we've had, we've experienced a setback. And I don't know if we can continue on. I don't know if that's God's purpose for us anymore. You know, things might look different. Even for Paul, they look different. He moved to a different city, didn't he? He didn't stay in the exact same location. Things did change. And so the details of what you're doing might look different, but the essentials of our purpose don't change. That's what I want you to know tonight. The details of your life, the circumstances of your life will look different. We're all aging. We're all changing. We're all in different seasons. Things will change. Setbacks will happen. Stuff is going to change. The details will look different, but the essentials of our purpose, they don't change. And if you're wondering what those are, you can find them pretty easily in the Bible. But it's knowing Him. It's knowing God. It's using your gifts to serve him wherever you are. It's telling people about him. Whichever people are around you, even if it is in a new city, even if it is in a new workplace, even if it is doing something you didn't think you were going to be doing, it's telling people about him. It's showing God's love by the way you love people. I can guarantee you that those purposes for your life will never change. And God, yes, gives us specific callings and specific promises and things like that. But those essential purposes will never change. If you're wondering what will help you carry on, those are the things that will help you to carry on. God is calling us to holiness, to intimacy with Him, to passion and zeal that overflows, to activation in ministry, to service, to sacrificing ourselves for the sake of others. That's right. Whatever we do, do it for the glory of God. And so even if the details look different, even if a setback happens, the key to standing up and coming back to pursue the purposes that we know, uh, to pursue the purposes that we know are constant, just keep pursuing Jesus. Keep pursuing Him. That's what will help you to carry on. You know, many moons ago, I feel like such an old lady saying that, but a long time ago, okay, um, I ran the young adults ministry back in the day, didn't I, James? I loved running young adults. It was like 
It was the glory days, okay? I Because I love people. I love Jesus. I love people. I love hanging out. I love doing fun things. I love gathering people. I love seeing people grow in their faith and just, you know, generally having a fun time. So young adults ministry was amazing. I loved it. I thought it was so fun. And, and you know, <clears throat> unfortunately, my season changed. And I'm, I'm not equating having four children to being stoned to death, okay? You need to hear me here. This is not equivalent, all right? Although if you could die from tiredness, there, there were times, okay? <laughs> but, okay, it's not the same thing. It's not, and in no way is having children a setback. Don't, don't take that snippet from what I am saying. It is a blessing. I love my season. But, things changed and things looked different. And I could maybe let my faith grow cold or dry or feel like I don't want to continue on if I put all of my identity and all of my hope and everything into that position and that season. But you know what I decided to do? I decided to just hold on to the things that were the same. I love Jesus. I love telling people about him. And so what what do I do? I just find some mums that need to know Jesus. I start a play group. And then I have my party there. It's just in the daytime, okay? And with a lot more chaos, but it's fun, all right? Anyway, let me finish tonight with my fourth point. And I just love this because at the end of this passage that we've been reading, it says, When they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The the last point is from turning your setback into a comeback that we need to remember is don't take your eyes off Jesus. To the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul's just reminding them, you know, all of these things have happened to me. I've had a wild ride, okay? There has been some setbacks and things are going to happen to you too. But just remember who it is that you believe in. You know, I've talked about running tonight and that verse, it says we run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You know, the thing that gives us a steadfast faith, a firm faith, an unwavering faith is, the, is that we put our faith in Jesus who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know, sometimes the things that shake us the most are the things that show us that our faith is in the wrong things. The things that shake us is when things don't go to plan and we put all of our faith in the outcome. We say, Jesus, if you answer my prayer in this way, then I'll know you're real. Or if you do this for me, or if my life looks like this, or if it's an easy path, or if everything turns out this way, that's when I will stay firm in my faith with you. But the thing that we need to remember is that it's only Jesus that will stay firm and secure and unwavering. Our faith that continues is a faith that isn't contingent on the outcomes. It's not based on the action we think God should take, but rather in who God is. You know, we can have an unshakable faith because we believe in a God who has unwavering love for us. I want to leave you with a verse in Lamentations. You probably know it. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. I hope that tonight you're left wanting more of God, wanting to just base your life in who he is. Not in what he can do for you, not in what the situation looks like, not in, not in the circumstances, not in the outcomes, but just in God. And that is what will give you a faith that's not a phase. It's not something that you're just going for for a little bit. It's that burning passion that continues on and endures. You know, I didn't want to call the message tonight, you know, surviving the setbacks, you know, just getting through it. It's not just surviving, it's coming back stronger. In James, it tells us to count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 
You know, trees, they actually need wind so they can grow. If a tree, you know, they tried to grow trees in like a greenhouse and they got to a certain height and they all just started falling over and they realised that, oh, there's no wind. And when there's wind, the trees actually, their roots go down deeper and get strengthened. And that's what helps them to stay up. Without challenge, there is no strengthening. And without setback, there is no strengthening and solidifying and and firming up of our faith. We need it. And God in His kindness allows us to go through it. Not to test us to see if we'll deny Him, but to strengthen us for the journey ahead. To give us the ability to run with perseverance your whole life. To have a legacy that says, I have put my trust in Jesus and He has never failed me and He will never fail me. I trust in Him. And so tonight I'm going to pray for us. We're going to open up the altar. We're going to, I want you, if you are experiencing a setback right now, maybe it's in your mind, maybe it's in your finances, maybe it's in your, the people around you, maybe it's something, a, a disappointment you're struggling with or an uncertainty about the future, whatever it is, whatever you're facing that you've been wrestling with, I want to join my faith with you tonight. I want to pray with you tonight. Together, we're going to pray for that unshakable faith, that you'll make your comeback, that God is going to use this trial to strengthen you, to He'll turn this thing for your good, whatever it is. And I'm going to pray with you tonight while we worship. Thanks for joining us. We pray that you and your family are richly blessed by the love and grace of Jesus. If you're ever in the area, we would love for you to join us for Sunday worship. 